recording again. Chima. Okay. I warned you not to listen to that gets my goat. Now look at you. Hello everybody, welcome to That Gets My Goat. I am Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. We're going to be brief today because we have no time and nothing to say. Yeah. It's a neat combination. On top of that, nothing we're allowed to say. Yeah, that was interesting. Let me... Oh, do you hear that? That's no, a... what do you hear? Oh, the buzzing the lights. Point. Okay, I'm putting the window back up, but gosh, it felt good. I the, did, yeah, the for breeze. For two seconds, guys, the breeze, the breeze, breeze blew through, through and, and I was alive again. I remember what it was like to be young and think that one day someone would love me. I, It's been a long time. It's been a long time since I rock and rolled. Not a fan of that song or any of their songs. <laughs> okay, so if you're, if you're looking at, the, if you're listening to this show via the website or if you have some kind of device that shows the episode art... That is the reason we're doing this episode, is uh, the other day I was at a toy store and I saw some action figures and it was Ghostbusters action figures and it was, uh, I was just like, wow, that's cool, the Ghostbusters are back in a big way, that's really neat. It was a Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man that lit up, um, just a cute little little, uh, accessory toy kind of thing. And I... You thought it was like one of them Funko toys where they're going back and doing like... Because their Funko did like Jaws action figures and Back to the Future ones and Goonies, I think they did. All these properties from the 80s that only people like us would want to buy. But uh, they were like, yeah, we'll, we'll lay it on the line for that. We expect them to buy. Maybe they realized that old nerds like us buy way more toys than actual kids. And yeah, that's that's what I thought it was because there was also a Slimer and he was, you know, identical to the 1984 Slimer and that. And so I was just like, wow, very, very cool, guys, that you would uh, make these toys. Uh, but then I turned the figure around and it had the image that you're looking at right now. The Stay Puft Marshmallow Man fighting four Ghostbusters and all four Ghostbusters were, were women. And I realized... Oh, this isn't a toy for the 1984 Ivan Reitman movie. This is a toy for the 2016... Oh my gosh, is Ghostbusters a remake? My friend, don't be a jerk. And I was horrified. (laughs) I emailed Big at the time, or texted him, and I was just like, Oh my gosh, did you know this? Did you know that it was a remake? Or or this much of a remake? We started talking about Gus Van Sant's shot-for-shot psycho remake. And how come we never see those? And and the reason is because it's madness. Why would anybody ever do a shot-for-shot remake? But when I saw that it was the exact, identical Stay Puft Marshmallow Man in the sailor costume with the same facial expression and Slimer was exact, identical, I was bummed out. Uh, Because... Because Ghostbusters wasn't going to be what you thought it was. Well, yeah, let's talk about that. Fooled you. It had. Let's talk about that for a minute. For years and years and years, for more than 20 years, Columbia Pictures had been trying to make a third Ghostbusters movie. And Bill Murray was always the holdout. For some reason, he was never happy with the scripts or he was never happy with the amount of money that they were willing to pay him. Or he he had not wanted to do Ghostbusters 2. And they had said, you know, what will it take? What will, Here you go, guy. Here you go. And it took five years for Ghostbusters 2 to get made, which was a long time in my childhood to wait for a sequel right. to something. Uh, and then finally it came out and he was just like, ugh, you know, that's one that I did for the money. I, I have no integrity. You know, <laughs> I don't think that it turned out that that great. And, but, uh, you know, it, it still made some money and uh, it didn't kill the franchise. There were people that, you know, that liked Ghostbusters 2, and there were people that were like, when's Ghostbusters 3 going to happen? And for years, they tried to get him to do it, and and, and he wouldn't do it. And then uh, Harold Ramis died, who was the co-writer of those two movies, you know, and he played e- Egon. And I think around that time, Reitman realized, hey, this is never going to happen now. And so as soon as that happened, as soon as he said, well, there's not going to be a Ghostbusters 3... Columbia said, oh, hey, it's time to reboot. And, you know, reboot has become this word that's ugly. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's anything. They call everything a reboot now. 
Uh, reboot is what you do when your computer freezes or when your when, computer, when there's stops an error working correctly. Right, is you start it over. You know, the Spider-Man franchise rebooted. Uh, the James Bond franchise rebooted. The Batman franchise rebooted. Right. It has negative connotations, but not as much as a remake does. And I, I will say rightly so. So when they announced that Kristen Wiig and... Melissa McCarthy. Melissa McCarthy. McCarthy. Right. And Chris Hemsworth. These guys are, are in a, a new Ghostbusters movie. In the back of my mind, it was like, okay, this is Ghostbusters colon the next generation. And it's like... No. Ghostbusters colon the new batch. Okay. Then I'm fine with the new batch, too. <laughs> the, the old Ghostbusters have retired or, I don't know been killed or our grandparents or whatever and it's time for a new batch of ghostbusters a new a bunch of new recruits you know uh, to take over the family business to take over this thing and there's going to be new threats to new york or, or to the world that they have to take on and i was just like eh, that that sounds fine and when they said well all four of them are going to be women believe it or not i thought well yeah that sounds fine that, wow that's going to be interesting, yeah, that's, yeah, that's interesting. i wonder how the dynamic's going to go with that. But what I didn't know was that it's Ghostbusters again. It's not Ghostbusters the new batch or Ghostbusters the next generation. The movie is called Ghostbusters. And, that... and they have obviously the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man and Slimer exactly the same as they used to be in it. And see, the logo is identical and their costumes are identical and they drive the Ecto-1 and it's identical but it's not a sequel, it's not a Force Awakens or a Star Trek 2009 or the Jurassic World or any of those, it's a remake and when I heard that there, you know, there never was a Ghostbusters in 1984 and these guys these ladies are picking up where they left off all my interest in the story and in the movie evaporated and I'm not ashamed to admit, I was kind of outraged when I found that out because it would be so easy, I mean, easier, guys, to just say, hey, oh, do you remember the Ghostbusters? Do you remember when you were a little girl and the Ghostbusters saved New York? You remember how that felt? We can do that again. You know, all that stuff. Building on those, that history with the franchise. But uh, I guess it's about the formation of some people that are going to fight ghosts and New York is under attack from Gozer the Gozerian and, you know, Zool and all that happy crappy and... and the key master and the gatekeeper. Well, look, if you're remaking the, the movie... The dog is going to be a CG, though. Yeah, uh, obviously. But if you're remaking it, you want to include the key master and the gatekeeper and Zool and Gozer and, yeah, the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. Although Who gets it's, to play Rick Moranis's part? What do you think? I, I don't know, because it's gender-bent, right? So you have a woman play that as well, or... Yeah. Because uh, apparently Hemsworth plays Janine. Yeah. Hemsworth is their receptionist. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can even say receptionist in 2016. <laughs> but if he's played by Chris Hemsworth, he can. You know, I don't know. I was just... I, 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 emailed, I texted you and said, you know, would you mind asking the people on Facebook if we could do an episode about not wanting to see this movie without being accused of... I don't want to say it. Do I have to say it? Do I have to say that word? Well, There's an offensive word. I'm sure it's going to be Warning, hard guys. to explain otherwise. So you're All have right, to say, say the word. Without being accused of being misogynist. Oh, God. This, this, I thought this this podcast was a safe zone. Is that what, was that what they safe call it? Safe space. Safe space? Okay. I hoped that people would give us the benefit of the doubt and we could just talk about that. Because my fear is that when this movie comes out in July... Anybody who has a problem with its remakes or if it's not very good or if it's not funny or if it's, you know, etc. will be accused of not liking it because it stars women. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I have uh, misjudged the world that we live in, uh, except for that I'm not. <laughs> and I haven't. So just wanted to put that out there. I, I am not excited to go see the movie but I, I don't think the fact that it has Wig and company in it is the re is a reason even. 
I, you know, I wonder, was there ever any discussion of having, look, we'll, we'll have, at least we'll have Aykroyd and Ernie Hudson, they want the work, to be in it, to play, you know, the last two Ghostbusters that are, that are still, still active, around. and they're about to close shop, and, you know, this, this young, plucky, I mean, not that Kristen Wiig is young, guys, but this plucky woman says, no, don't close your doors. No, 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 we can, this is a good thing. You, the, New York needs you. Holy God, guys, it's writing itself. New York needs you. Please give us till the end of Saturday. And, and I, I, I will ask everyone I know, and we, and you don't have to close your doors. We will continue your life's work. And so she finds uh, Melissa McCarthy doing fill in funny thing. She's a meter maid, let's say that, and everybody hates meter maids, and she takes her job insanely seriously to the point where she, like, shrieks at people, and she purposely distracts them so that the uh, the meter runs out so she can give them a ticket. And he's like, whoa, 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 you were asking me all these questions about directions and stuff, and it's like, yes, but look, that's expired. That's clearly expired. Ha, ha, ha. And then, um, what, gosh, what's the blonde's name? For, or, <laughs> I don't know, The big know, black man. lady from... Uh, Melissa McCarthy and Kristen Wiig are the only names I know. Okay, and then, so she's got a, a landlady who's the, who, the, the big, scary, angry African-American lady. She's the, her, her, her landlord. And just everyone is terrified of her. And she's just like, oh, do you like being a landlord? He's like, hell no, I don't like... What's wrong with you? And he's like, ah. The reason I'm asking is because... There's a. Do you remember the Ghostbusters? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, the Ghostbusters. Yeah, we said Zed Moore. He was like, okay. It's writing itself, folks. <laughs> and so she brings these four. These there's four women recruits to be Ghostbusters, and Dan Aykroyd has written this just hilarious speech where he talks about what's been going on for the last thirty years, and he r- performs it in one breath where he talks about like 19 different things that have threatened New York that nobody knows about and nobody's grateful for. Many of slorgs roasted in the belly of whatever. Yeah. (laughs) Dan Aykroyd was great at writing those kind of things. You know, the the next time they they, they chose a new form for him, that of a giant slore, many shubs and zools knew what it was to be roasted in the belly of the slore that day, I can tell you. (laughs) He is able to write this dialogue that is nonsense, but it's almost poetry. (laughs) And And I would love to hear him. He's just like, wow, okay. And then, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this very nearly happened, and then this actually happened. But we were actually to go back and make it unhappen, and that you know, kind of all these things. And she's like, "Wow, yeah, that sounds, uh, that sounds great, guys." And she looks around. The other three have left. They're just like, "Oh!" In that three-minute speech that Dan Aykroyd made, the other three have just headed for the hills. And she has to go back and get them to come back on board. And then, yeah, New York is threatened by the supernatural. And these four ladies learn to work together. And at the end, maybe even a Bill Murray cameo, somebody is just like, oh, you, you ladies did a good job. Ghostbusters that'll, are back. That'll do. That'll do, Wig. <laughs> there you do. go. <laughs> You're welcome, guys. I'll be here. That, oh, it did. It wrote itself. Yeah, okay, I've, I've been talking, but I just, I really had to get that out there. And now I... I, now that it's out there, uh, I'm spent. Well, I, I have to agree with you. If that if truly is what this show is, and we've complained somewhat, at least, on this show about the unimaginativeness of Hollywood these days. There are no new properties. They're all just take. They're just taking everything off the shelf. I I, I feel bad for millennials. Because nobody gives a shit about them. They're not making movies for millennials. Every single thing is taken out of the dustbin of the past, dusted off, and put up on the shelf again. And it's Transformers. It's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. It's superheroes from the you know 60s and the 70s and the 80s. It's Star Wars again. It's Indiana Jones again. It's all this crap that, you know, millennials' parents or, I don't know, older brothers grew up with. There's nothing new for them. There's nothing that they can say, oh, yeah, I remember when I was a kid and, I, we, and that movie came out. I guess maybe you could say that they made Jurassic World for millennials because Jurassic Park didn't come out until mid-90s, right? Or was it It was early? 93. I don't know oh, if that counts. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's mid 
Does that count as mid? Early to mid 90s, we'll say it that way. So maybe you could say Jurassic World was for them, but that's the closest that it's come. Yeah, there's there's nothing new in Hollywood. They're just recycling everything. And yeah, the worst of the bunch are the remakes. And a lot of them are, it's hard to say what, you know, I, I, they've come up with that new term of reboot. So they don't have to say remake. But, but, but reboot, there's like a positive spin to that. Because it's reboot is yeah, fixing, fixing something it. that's broken. Or that's gotten too full of errors or continuity or you know the hard drive is full so you got to reboot I, I i don't know computers speak but that's the thing you know it's like when your browser is going super slow it's time to reboot yeah you gotta restart that thing but remakes have had a negative connotation our whole lives and rightly so yeah because why why do you, you know, need a remake especially in the 70s and 80s when people were remaking movies you know like from the 50s it was just like, wow, that's that's too bad. You know, Hollywood's not making anything new anymore. That you could say that in 1978 or something is hilarious. Now, holy cow, guys. Uh, to have a movie like Inside Out or to have a movie like Inception come out where it's not a yeah, remake or a reboot or reimagining or a live-action version of... Of Sleeping a Beauty or, earlier, or, or like yeah, Jungle Book, Alice in Wonderland, or any of those. Cinderella, that seems really, really novel, and it's it's a risk. And we could do a whole episode where we talk about that. You know, it's not really Hollywood's fault because they they're investing so much money in these movies. There's no such thing as like we made a quick twelve million dollar movie or fifteen million dollar movie. There's no movies like My Big Fat Greek Wedding made anymore. There's only There's movies like My, my Big, Big Fat, Fat Greek, Greek Wedding, Wedding 2. 2 being made. Well done. He beat me to the punch on that, guys. Yeah. And that's too bad, but I can kind of understand their mindset where they say, <laughs> we tested this before we even spend a dime on it. And, you know, 60% of people that we talked to remembered the Power <laughs> Rangers. And so we can expect between 70 and $90 million opening weekend yeah. for Power Rangers... 2017. I, if I were one of those big shots, I would be like, wow, all right. Then that is green lit, guys. We will do Power Rangers 2017. Let's pick the date. Let's start working on the special effects. Um, maybe we should get a screenwriter. I don't know. But, uh, oh, work on the poster. That's, that's more important. Let's do that right now so that we can market it. And uh, it sucks. It's creatively bankrupt, but I understand why they do it. Yeah, Hollywood is a business. Um, I was even going to talk about the, the, the movie that came out just this month is that Mother's Day movie. <laughs> yeah. Even came that, mind, that, yes. that is building on oh, New Year's Day and Valentine's Day, right? Yeah, both Gary Marshall holiday-themed ensemble romantic comedies. So even that they're doing, it's... Uh, I, I saw an interview with Gary Marshall, and he was talking about, how, oh, yeah, I, I make movies for women. I can't do the big explosions and people fly. I mean, I know how to do them, but I would rather do this, and I, I can't do the big, crazy movies like that. And it's just like... 83 doing, years old, guys. You're just doing a damn sequel. Who cares? <laughs> it's all the same. You trying to talk about how, like, oh, my movies are softer and more special... Yeah, whatever. It's, but the same it's day, just part three of your freaking trilogy. Didn't Angry Birds the movie come out that that, that uh, day? Did it? And didn't Ooh. Captain America: Civil War Next come week? out that time? And yeah, live action Jungle Book uh, and the Huntsman: Colon Winter's War. I mean, this was all in a three week stretch, right? These these movies came out. All of them uh, retreads or reboots or remakes or sequels. Sequels or um, and crap. It doesn't mean that it's bad. I, I can't wait to see Civil War. I, I'm super, super excited. And it, it's introducing Spider-Man, who will be back next year with a... Do we say it? Reboot! A reboot of the Spider-Man franchise. But guess what? I'm excited for that. So I'm I'm as bad as, as everybody. But the difference is... Well, we don't know. I hope that there's a difference. I hope it's not Sam Raimi's 2002 Spider-Man movie 
being remade. Oh, gosh. It, and my they, guess is it's not. They would be crazy to do that. If they do the origin story again, then there may be... No, I'm not, I can't say that because that would get me in jail. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I would have issues. We'll just say, we'll, we'll just stop there. Anyhow, I, I think we should just end the episode talking about your friend Ian. And yeah, a couple years ago... My friend, your friend Ian, you mean? Okay, our, our collective <laughs> ex-friend Ian. There was a movie in the 90s, right about the time of Jurassic Park, not too long uh, Yeah, I'd say it was 92. It. 92, Summer of 92, maybe 91, this movie came out called Point Break. It was a pretty big film for the time period. I mean, there, it wasn't always everything has to be a gigantic blockbuster like it is now, so it didn't make a billion dollars. But it made a, a lot of. It made at least a hundred million, um, and uh, yeah, it was it was a good movie. It was enjoyable. Uh, I liked it a lot. We had uh, we used to hang out with these girls that just absolutely loved it. I think they might have been like nursing a crush for Patrick Swayze from like Dirty Dancing and uh, uh, Ghost, Ghost, and Big Trouble in Little China. But but. That was Kurt Russell, wasn't it? <laughs> Those two always confuse me. They're so similar. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, so this movie came out. We liked it a lot. We watched it a bunch of times at this these girls' house, etc., etc. The years went by. And on Facebook, an announcement uh, came out that uh, they were doing a new point break for a new generation they were remaking Point Break. And this friend of ours who works in the in entertainment industry, he's not just like a loser podcaster like the two of us. He actually has a job for a film company. And this guy posts this and says, Is nothing sacred? <laughs> Are they just going to remake everything from my youth? The line must be drawn here. <laughs> Uh, I don't remember exactly what he said, but it was it was a ridiculous you, turn of phrase to use for a movie like Point Break, which has has been forgotten. I mean, it's forgotten. It's it's a good movie, and I'd show it to anybody. I'd show it to my kids and say, "Yeah, check out this. This is a good movie, huh?" See, I I, I have no such memories. Nobody talked about Point Break when in, when I was young. And in the 90s, nobody talked about Point Break. I don't remember it being yeah. good. The only time anybody would ever bring it up was to make fun of Keanu Reeves saying, I am an FBI agent. <laughs> That's the only time. Victoria! Oh, wait, that was a different one. Sorry. But yeah, I mean, it was a good movie. I would show it to people. I would, but uh, is nothing sacred? I don't, I, I couldn't <laughs> go there. I mean, this is definitely not the sacred cow that can't be killed. Um... But yeah, this is the one. This was the remake that broke the camel's back for Ian. This was the line he'd drawn in the sand and said, they can remake Citizen Kane. <laughs> they can do a hip-hop version of Gone with the Wind, but not Point Break. But not an extreme sports Point Break with wingsuits. Uh, point Break came and went. It came out in the wake of uh, The Force Awakens. Nobody went to see Point Break, the remake. Nobody cares. I mean, maybe Ian cared. Maybe he took his hat off and mourned said, when it came yeah, out. But a little he didn't have to mourn very long because <laughs> it was absolutely tossed under the under the rug, uh, swept. swept. There under you go. The rug. Under the rug, and and rightly so. And I don't know that Ghostbusters 2.0 is going to be that way. I could be totally wrong, and it comes out, and it's a huge hit, and everybody loves it, and says, wow, it'll make you fall in love with the Ghostbusters again. In which case, maybe there will be a follow-up episode. Yeah, uh, where with, we with have egg some on my face. crow to eat. And I won't have low blood sugar that day. And you know, it's like Rick Moranis playing... Melissa McCarthy's dad in the movie where it's like, holy cow, I had no idea. That's brilliant. Oh, That would be awesome. But, I, yeah. Maybe and Sigourney Chubsy. Weaver is uh, Kristen Wiig's mother. She's, so she's, she's uh, Dana Barrett's daughter who remembers her mother 
talking about being saved by the Ghostbusters and <sighs> could be cool. Why am I? Yeah, no, none of that stuff is going to be in this movie, guys. Why? Why do I keep trying what? to come up yeah. with ideas? I don't know. But yeah, so there you are. Hopefully, that is a non-misogynist disappointment at the new Ghostbusters coming out. Probably not, though. I mean, it's, there's probably some underlying misogyny or something in there. Is there really? There I, has to be. I, but... No, admit it. I, uh, Anyways. <laughs> so that's uh, our show for today, folks. Hopefully you enjoyed it, and you will still listen to us again next time. I'm Mick Anklovich. And I'm Rich Outfield. And uh, we are ready to believe you. And this man has no dick. Hey! <laughs> At least that's what I heard. That Gets My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons non-commercial 3.0 license. Boy, they must really think a lot of themselves. Our cast list for today goes as follows. Did you fart? I farted so bad it hurt. (laughs) Oh, yikes. It burns.